Good afternoon. Welcome to the Carnegie Council lunchtime webinar series and thanks for joining us. Today's topic is Mysterious Machines, the road ahead for AI ethics and international security. And our guest is our good friend, Carnegie Council Senior Fellow, Arthur Holland Michelle. Arthur, good to see you. Hi, John. Arthur's joining us from his home in Barcelona. In addition to his role as senior fellow at the council, Arthur is now associate researcher at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, affectionately known as UNIDIR. And at UNIDIR, he's working on the uses of artificial intelligence in the design and implementation of security systems. Now, I've been lucky to know Arthur over many years. Uh, first as a student at Bard College, and then as the co-founder and director of the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard. His work at the center led to the publication of his recent book, Eyes in the Sky, which documents the origins of modern aerial surveillance. And today we wanna to talk about the growing capacities of artificial intelligence and how these new capabilities are affecting international, and I guess today we'll talk about domestic, security uh, as well, public security generally. We also wanna talk about parallel developments in AI ethics and how ethical issues are helping to shape our understanding of security in an increasingly tech-driven environment. Now, before we turn over to Arthur, I just wanna say a word about our format. Uh, the first half of the program will be a dialogue between Arthur and me, but the back half will be interactive. So I'm gonna encourage you now uh, to use the chat function to pose questions as we go. And when we get to the second half hour, uh, Alex Woodson, our moderator, will read questions on behalf of the audience. So Arthur, I thought we'd start off with a you know, brief discussion of AI ethics. Um, there's been a lot happening um, in the past few years. Uh, and we can have a general discussion about where we are now, uh, what's been accomplished and what needs to be done. Um, but, you know, it seems that today in particular, um, given these new technologies and their, their uses, uh, particularly with the protests that we're seeing uh, all across the United States, and I understand even uh, overseas now, um, there are some particular applications that, um, you know, speak to your work uh, previously. And just to kick off the conversation, I wanted to start with a brief quote from you. Uh, at a previous uh, engagement that you had at Carnegie Council when we were talking about the uses of surveillance technology um, in, uh, in terms of protests. And it, this is just a quick quote. Surely there were times in history when protesters who have every right to do what they were doing were referred to by authorities as thugs. And we should be very glad that those authorities did not in every case have access to technologies like this, meaning the surveillance technologies that would allow them to act on those beliefs. We have controls in place for this very reason. So I wonder if you could just kind of pick up on that um, and to talk a little bit about sort of ethical principles in terms of how they govern the use of new technologies in the surveillance space and also then moving into the AI space. Sure. Thank you, Joel. And um, it's wonderful to be here and, and to be chatting with you again. And, um, and I'm so glad that uh, I can be a part of the Carnegie Council to engage in the, precisely these types of discussions. Uh, over the last few days, I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the, the present uh, situation and how it uh, relates um, to, to these topics. And um, there's a connection on two planes. Um, the, the quote that, that you read out, uh, it, I'm referring to a particular type of technology that can watch a very wide area uh, from the sky and um, track individuals. And what I realized was that this technology could be tremendously effective for say, observing a, uh, a convening or a protest uh, or a demonstration and then tracking individuals who participated back to their homes. People who previously had the a right to anonymity in the exercise of the first amendment um, 
that anonymity can be very quickly uh, pulled away. And I particularly started thinking about that, that specific application of the technology because an individual who develops this technology, who I spent some time with while writing the book, told me over the course of conversations that he had actually flown his wide area aerial surveillance plane over uh, St. Louis, Missouri during the Michael Brown protests a few years ago. He said it was just for a test, sure. But he had also told me in separate conversations that he was uh, very much against the Black Lives Matter movement and had, and even in some cases referred to the people participating in this movement as thugs. And when I asked him if he would pass the information that he had collected from this surveillance system onto the authorities if he saw something untoward, he said, yes, absolutely. And that really, you know, that, that, that didn't sit all that easily with me because, um, you know, the ease with which that right could be torn away by this new technological reality uh, was, was something that um, I hadn't contemplated before. And so that's why I say there are two planes here. The first plane is that um, these movements are happening in a technological reality that is unprecedented in terms of the volume of data that can be collected and the ways that that data can be pro uh, processed. It can be um, compiled, so you don't just have one source of data, but you have many sources of data and you can piece together uh, the, the very detailed portraits of those you're observing from this information that is widely available. Um, there are technologies that we don't necessarily know all about. There isn't much transparency as to whether they are uh, applied and employed. But what we do know is that the ease with which those rights can be intruded upon uh, is, is totally unprecedented. And so that's why I think it's really relevant to look at these things in the context of what's happening. But the second plane of thought that comes to me around what's going on is that this present situation shows to us just how profoundly far behind in the, in the, in the striving for equality we actually are, that, that, that society remains profoundly unequal and unfair and that those inequalities are systemic and they can't just be sort of pasted over. And when these technologies emerge in the context of a systemically in unequal society, um, then all the more care is needed to ensure that abuses don't happen because these technologies, as I said in the, uh, a few minutes ago, so easily lend themselves to those kinds of abuses. And because they raise real questions that are problematic precisely because of inequality. I think that a lot of the issues that we're gonna be talking about over the course of this conversation, specifically with regards to AI, wouldn't necessarily be issues in a totally equal egalitarian society. But we see today and the last few days that we don't live in such a society. And that's precisely why we need to have this, um, this conversation. That's why this conversation is more urgent uh, than ever, because if not, these technologies could perpetuate those inequalities. And that's the last thing we need. Just, uh, I'm going to follow up just a little bit on that, and then I know you want to get to the broader um, area of just AI ethics and the principles that are being established. But just on this question of, it goes to equality and inequality, but it goes more to just the question of power and who has it. Um, in this previous uh, engagement at Carnegie, you also mentioned that you, that you were able to, um, to look at a um, Pentagon manual um, in terms of how they think about surveillance, the principles by which they're thinking about surveillance. Again, this is in the national security domain, but again, this is a, at, at the principal level. And the idea on this surveillance idea is not just to have the ability to watch, but to let the adversaries know that um, 
that, as you said, but to give them the sense that we know even their intent so that they are always looking over their shoulder. The idea being that those who have the technology not only have the ability, but, but you know, the idea that, that, those, that others know that they are being watched. Yeah, and the, the power that it gives first to the government, but then also um, to also commercial enterprises or others who just have the technology. You had mentioned this private citizen who has the technology. Yeah. I wonder no. if you could just say, say a little bit more about that, that potential uh, to, in terms of those who have the technology to use that power, whether it's government, commercial or private. So, yeah. That goes to an interesting thought. Um, the, you know, there is a lot of hype in the world of AI and um, some cases that just leads to sort of disappointment. This robot that we thought would be able to, you know, play soccer, it turns out can't do that. But um, th that hype has really troubling implications in the, in the security sphere because um, you know, I, I speak to people and they assume that there are artificially intelligent drones flying overhead at any given time and uh, that, that these systems can really do a lot of things that perhaps they, they cannot. Um, and so it, in a sense, um, you know, the, 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 there's an AI hype element there that is not to be discounted though, because there is something very intentional about that purpose to give the adversary a sense that you can see everything. Uh, you know, a lot of these systems that I wrote about in the book, which are primarily military systems, uh, have um, names like, you know, Gorgon Stare or Constant Hawk. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, that, is, that was a military handbook, but as we are seeing all too clearly, there is a tendency for not only technologies, but also techniques to creep back from the battlefield into the domestic space and to blur indeed the line between the domestic space and, uh, and, and the battlefield. And, uh, you know, an example of that is that the company that makes the Gorgon Stare surveillance system uh, unveiled a few years ago a civilian version for, for law enforcement that had pretty much the same capabilities and they called it vigilance there. So, you know, they're not necessarily trying to roll back the effect of giving this, uh, this sense of, of, of panopticism, this sense of being able to, to, see, uh, to, to see everything. And again, if you combine that with the notion that we don't really know what these systems are able to do. Maybe there is some hype, but these systems again are very, very powerful, even without the hype accounted for. Um, then it really does give you a sense that, you know, maybe, um, maybe they are watching. Maybe you shouldn't show up to a a a, a demonstration. Um, you know, and that that potentiality is gets very dangerously close to infringing upon enshrined rights. And again, this technological reality that we exist within, um, it, 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 it exacerbates that effect, I would say, because now one police officer sitting at a console has access to all of these tools. It's not the person down the street who may be informing on you. I mean, that, you know, there's long history of, sort of old school techniques of creating panopticism, um, but the, the, the efficiency with, it, with, it, with which these, this, this technology can enable that sort of thing, either real or imagined, um, can have a profound psychological effect that I think people should be talking about. Well, yeah, Arthur, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention when you say real or imagined, well, I think we're in a real space right now when the president has used the language of dominate the streets. Mm. This is yeah. coming from the president um, and standing next to him is the secretary of defense yeah. um, who talks about battle, you know, battle spaces and so on, uh, who's standing next to the chairman of the joint chiefs, who's standing yeah. next to the attorney general. Yeah. So, um, you know, we can talk about this at a, at a level of high principle, but this is, you know, these, these things are happening now. Um, yeah. And um, it's very interesting. And you, given your um, 
research and your experience can see also the connection between the sort of national security into the domestic public security and how these technologies sort of straddle both. Um, yeah. And I, I wasn't intending to go there, but is, is there something that we could share with the audience about that relationship? I guess that goes a little bit to the commercial enterprise as well, but you know, how does it, how does the, how do you think about you know, sort of the development of these technologies? They, I think many of them started in a national security realm, but we're now seeing this sort of movement into public security in the domestic area. Yeah, it's, it's a very real pipeline. Yeah. It's a pipeline that is perhaps um, exacerbated by the fact that the kinds of battlefields that are predominant uh, and preeminent today, um, if you squint, uh, are quite similar to the kinds of domestic environments where law enforcement operates. That was not necessarily the case during the Cold War when the types of battles that countries were by and large preparing for uh, you know, involved tanks and maneuver and um, sort of strategic level motions. Whereas now you think about things like counterinsurgency and this blurred line, even in those theaters between policing and military action. Um, mm -hmm. And on the sort of technological side, there is the fact that there is less of a divide, specifically when you talk about software and surveillance between sort of what is possible and applicable in the military realm and what is possible and applicable in the, in the civilian uh, realm. So, you know, uh, cameras operate the same whether they're operating abroad or, or domestically. You uh, may want to analyze data in the same way uh, domestically as, as you might want to abroad. And, and the code uh, is, is very, you know, shares a lot in common. In fact, you may even be able to uh, take those same capabilities and just apply them in, in a new environment, which again is not something that necessarily uh, was always the case. Um, it's all the more the case, I think, when you are just talking about software or you're talking about the cloud. Um, right. And so in that context, specifically and all the more so in light of the way sometimes uh, domestic space is referred to in law enforcement in terms that very closely mirror the way the battle space has been referred to. Um, it, it, it's definitely, uh, grounds for pause and um, and this is nothing new. I mean, we've been seeing the growing sort of uh, this, this expanding pipeline from the battle space to the civilian space for the last, you know, 20 years or, mm -hmm. or, or, or more. And we're starting to see the culmination of that, but it, that process will probably get faster um, as the difference between those two spaces Right. and the technology themselves uh, diminishes. Right. Thank you, Arthur. I wanted to now sort of move into, you know, that sort of general conversation we were gonna have about AI ethics and kind of where it is. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just say a little bit now, moving into AI specifically about the yeah. ability of, 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 of artificial systems and so on, uh, in terms of this, uh, their, their ability to actually to sort of think and decide and to make decisions and what mm -hmm. principles that we need to think about in terms of creating those systems and, and where we are now, because I know there are many initiatives to, to begin to look at that. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that um, the, the debate on AI is nothing new. Um, in fact, these debates have been going on for, for, for quite a long time in all sorts of different fora. And there has been tremendous progress in, in these debates. Um, what uh, we've observed in the last few years is that uh, these debates have started to coalesce in a, a profusion of uh, ethical principles for AI. And that goes across the board among 
governments, private institutions, local, you know, city governments and municipalities, um, military entities. That, you know, it, it seems almost like every week that someone is announcing their AI principles. And um, I'm not going to go through all of the principles that, that uh, exist. I should also note that, um, you know, I specifically look at the international security realm. A lot of these principles are, are, are sort of broadly declared for AI in all kinds of verticals, you know, uh, loan decisions, uh, medical, uh, you know, systems and diagnostics, you name it. Um, but of specific relevance, I think, to uh, the, the, the international security realm, the, the, a few principles have sort of emerged. Um, one is this really universal principle that um, AI has dangerous potentials, and so it must be used for good. There must be a, an active, uh, proactive decision to use the system well, sort of non-maleficence. Um, there's a fantastic paper in Nature Machine Intelligence that did a meta-analysis of all the different, I think they found 84 AI ethics declarations and a number of commonalities emerged, including this one quite near the top. Um, there is also this principle of, of fairness and, and, and inclusivity, uh, th this notion that AI systems shouldn't, and this goes to what we were talking about at the beginning of the discussion, shouldn't be embedded with bias or perpetuate bias. And, and, and that has come front and center as well. Um, people are starting to realize that AI systems can be vulnerable to attack and uh, just beyond that, AI systems are going to become sort of like critical infrastructure. I mean, they're going to be doing important things. And so in that regard, they have to be secure. They have to be robust, sort of like, an, you know, everyone agrees that an airplane, because it is vulnerable and can be, you know, attacked and is critical, uh, needs to be secure and robust. Um, there's also this sense that AI needs to be transparent and accountable, right? That those who operate the AI can't keep, shouldn't keep their methods and their data and their architectures secret from the people that the AI affects. And that's a particularly important one in the security realm because obviously there is a prerogative in the security space um, from the perspective of the operator to keep some of your techniques and architectures secret. Um, and finally, and, and, and this one is, is, is very important, um, this notion that AIs are not humans, that you know, the optimal outcome is the symbiosis, if you will, uh, the, the co-working between a human and an artificial intelligence, that it's not just sending out the, the, these artificial intelligence systems to do whatever they may do uh, without regard for, you know, um, potential consequences. And crucially, that humans will always be responsible for what AI does, right? And, and that's actually become almost enshrined as a principle in this very contentious debate in the international space around military AI systems. And in particular, the notion of a lethal autonomous weapon, a system that, you know, can uh, go out and identify targets on its own and engage those targets. And there seems to be a, a, a sort of mounting consensus that whatever the technology is, whatever it does, the buck always stops with the, with the human. Um, so there, those are just a few. I think that's where we are at sort of now in terms of sort of these declarations that we've seen. So the next step is then how do we operationalize these principles as you lay them out there, you know, these issues of accountability, of fairness, of transparency, right? These are, these are great. You know, they kind of give us a framework to think about creating a system that will be, you know, responsive to principles, but maybe you could pick an example or two. Um, you could say more about lethal autonomous weapons or, or some other AI system perhaps that's in some contention and how should we think about making these principles matter in the operating of these systems? Sure, so um, 
There has been a lot of focus on the idea of a fully autonomous lethal weapon system. Um, funnily enough, the debate uh, when it truly started uh, about 10 years ago about you know, the, the, ethic, the ethics, uh, morality and prudence of using such a machine, um, we're looking way into the future at these like Terminator-like devices. And in fact, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of the media coverage of this debate, um, you know, the image at the top would always be an image from the Terminator movies. Um, that has sort of rolled back in the last few years as people have realized that one, that's very far away. Uh, as a technological sort of um, technologically feasible uh, prospect. And, and two, that there are um, sort of less ambitious forms of autonomy in the military space that could nevertheless be, be problematic. Um, so I, I am particularly interested in um, this notion of what I call lethality enabling autonomous weapons. So it's not the autonomous robotic drone that can identify targets and shoot at those targets. But it's an, it's an assistant, if you will, that's operating next to the military operator. And it points to particular places, say on the battlefield and says, this is where the enemy is. And perhaps this is how you should take the enemy out. Or uh, if you do decide to use this particular missile, say, um, this is the likely effect. Um, and th there are a whole range of uh, still troubling issues that need to be addressed in operationalizing those principles that I talked about in the context of that. Um, at, at you, yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's really helpful in terms of thinking about it as a kind of, a, of an assistance or a tool. I mean, I'm imagining you know, other automated systems. So even when you fly on an airplane, mo most of it's automated, right? But yeah. the pilot is there, right? To, yeah. Right, and then I would imagine, as you mentioned too, in medicine and diagnostics, right? So AI systems are tremendous and perhaps they outperform human. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, we still want to have the doctor, right? To be, to be working with this system in some way. Yes, right? that's yeah. a crucial point. This, yeah. this notion that you don't solve all the problems necessarily by just keeping the human in the loop to use a sort of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the term that, that is often employed here. In fact, as my research is, is pointing at increasingly, um, the problems really only begin when you have this human machine uh, interaction. It's a very fraught and potentially complex relationship and it will still, need to be addressed in one way or another. Those principles aren't enough. Right. So Arthur, we, we have a ton of questions that are rolling in, but I want to ask one more just so that we can fully get to the, you know, what AI is in its, in its essence. And, um, and I think that will help also just give us a fuller picture of the challenge of sort of thinking about it from an ethical dimension. And that you had mentioned prior and when we set this up to talk a little bit about the black box dilemma. Yeah. And I yeah. wonder if you could just share a little bit of your thinking about that. And I just think that that helps to complete the picture in terms of what AI is and why yeah. it's so yeah. challenging to, to sort of put into a moral or ethical frame. And then we'll go quickly to the questions. Sure. The, yeah. the black box, which I, I should clarify because it's a little confusing. Uh, is essentially the opposite of a black box in an airplane, right? Which a black box in an airplane will tell you everything that happened in the airplane. When you, uh, when you talk about a black box AI system, it's like there is a black box somewhere, but it's at the bottom of the sea and you're never gonna find it. Um, people have started talking about this notion of a black box AI system and more broadly about the notion of explainability in AI. Um, why is that important? Well, as a feature, AI systems are unpredictable. Uh, you know, you want them to be able to observe an unstructured environment, if you will, 
and know how to negotiate it in a way that's maybe more effective or faster than a human. And as, as such, they, um, you know, we can't perfectly model how they are going to uh, behave. They are predictably unpredictable in a way. And they especially tend to do sometimes, in some cases, weird things at those sort of edge cases. You give an AI system a scenario that it's never encountered before, and it may not act the way a human would act in that scenario, which is, I don't know what to do here. The AI system might just barge ahead and do something that a human would think is irrational. So that's why you want AI systems to be understandable. You want them to be able to explain what they're doing um, so that the operator can know at any given time whether a system is behaving rationally or whether there is perhaps a problem with the data. And if that system doesn't give that insight into its operations, it's what's sometimes referred to as a black box AI system. AI has existed for a long time, but the AI that existed decades ago uh, was very transparent. It was rules-based. If this happens, then I will do this. Uh, the, the kinds of systems that are gaining favor today are much more complex. They're probabilistic. You give them a data set, you tell it what you're looking for in that data set or what you want it to look for, and it will run that through a very complex probabilistic process that is very difficult even for a, a, a scientist who works in this stuff to explain. Um, so now the challenge is how to make systems that are either not that, not a black box, or systems that can explain themselves in some way. And it's a huge challenge because what counts as explainable to me might not be the same thing as what is explainable to you. Um, it will also depend on the application. Um, if you're talking, for example, about a law enforcement application, you probably want the system to be very explainable because there are very, very high stakes there. But the person operating that system probably doesn't have a PhD in electrical engineering. And so finding those balances in given especially the fact that the technology is moving so quickly is, is a tremendous challenge. And so that's actually one research report that I'm working on uh, right now is uh, how to define these, these features. And it's just one example, I guess the, 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 the lesson to impart from all this is one example of the challenges. That's just one tiny corner of the challenges of operationalizing uh, some of these principles because again, it goes to so many of these principles. You want to be able to explain the AI system to the person who was affected by it. Well, if it's a convolutional neural network, chances are you're not going to be able to hold true to that uh, principle. And so the hope is that rules and norms and standards will coalesce around that problem in the years ahead. But it's, it's a tricky one, certainly. Great. Thank you, Arthur. That was really very helpful. I want to turn now to Alex Woodson, who has the uh, big job of weeding through these. As you can see, this is lots and lots of questions. So we'll take as many as we can over the next 30 minutes or so. Yeah, thanks, Joel. As you said, this is a very big job today. But these are great questions, so I'm happy, happy to do it. Uh, we'll start with our senior fellow, Carnegie Council senior fellow, Jeff McCausland. He did a webinar a few weeks ago. Um, he has two questions, both are really great. I'm gonna stick with one for now. The question is, since the military now talks about cyber and space as warfare domains now like air, land, and sea, doesn't the question of autonomous weapons and AI have even more significant implications in these realms as you could have the automatic response by a machine in cyber or space that could have catastrophic consequences for escalation? It's a great question. And I'm gonna split the hair a little bit on that and uh, regard space and cyber as very different domains um, where very different dynamics apply. There is a growing conversation about the implications of AI in cyberspace, but it's a bit of a muddled conversation because a lot of the agents that already exist 
in cyber warfare are at the very least highly automated and will operate in, in ways that, you know, if you thought in terms of the metaphor of a drone, I mean, it's really very distant from uh, you know, the operator and may go through several steps without say checking uh, back in. Um, so you know, in a way, some of these considerations already exist in cyberspace. It's certainly true that when you apply these AI methods in cyberspace, you may get further gains in capability and there may be trade-offs there in terms of how much control you have on the system. Um, but what we're still seeing in the cyberspace is a, 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 a difficulty in drawing those definitional contours around what would count as a sort of truly uh, autonomous agent in the way that we're debating them in regards to kinetic physical weapons. Um, in space, it's, it's an angle that um, is much less explored, but will probably be uh, explored all the more uh, with the advent of greater militarization in space. Uh, there's a separate program at UNIDIR um, that has a large initiative on, on, on what's happening in space. Um, from an aut autonomy perspective, space is, is easier in a sense because there's much less to crash into. <laughs> um, so you, uh, and of course there's a much greater physical uh, distance and you may have challenges actually maintaining communication between this agent and the operator. And so in, in that sense, at the very least there, it will be a stronger, I think, uh, signal that, uh, creates demand for, for autonomy in space just because of the nature of the environment. Whether the application of autonomy in space creates unfamiliar questions or questions that we haven't considered in the debate around ground-based uh, or atmospheric autonomy, uh, that's uncharted territory. That's a debate that I'd be very interested in, in watching un un unfold. Thanks. Um, we'll go to a question that was emailed to us from Amadou Ould Abdallah. He writes, with every innovation, people are concerned with their privacy, then they get to live with it. Won't that be the same with mysterious machines? So asking, will, will people just be accepting of, of these new machines in the future? This is a, a question that I've, I've grappled with a lot um, over the years. And um, I, I always want to be the optimist in, in, in these regards. And I think I have reason to be optimistic here because the debate around privacy that we're seeing today feels different to the debate a few years ago. It feels like perhaps there has been an inflection point on a broader scale. And that has been very much prompted by some of the technologies that I write about and that I feel are most concerning. Uh, things like social media or the application of artificial intelligence to dense uh, networks of sensors like you know cities that have lots of CCTV cameras putting an algorithm on top of that so you can track people uh, better. While there is a long history of us humans just getting used to greater and greater incursions upon our privacy, um, th there are there have also been moments where we've said actually no that's not okay. Uh, uh, an example that comes to mind immediately is the history of wiretapping. You know, uh, pretty soon after the advent of the telephone, law enforcement agencies figured out how you could literally physically tap into the cables and listen in on whatever conversation you want. And in the United States um, and in most other countries, um, there was a, a, a pretty um, universal rejection of that possibility. And that is why there are strict warrant 
requirements for uh, phone taps today. Any law enforcement agency can't just listen to whatever phone they want, they have to have probable cause. And so my sense is that it's just in our nature that when there is an intrusion that is a step too far, um, we say no. I'll give you one more example of a case that I think will qualify uh, for, as, as being an example of that phenomena. A few months ago, uh, thanks to the reporting of uh, a reporter at the New York Times, Kashmir Hill, it came to light that um, there was a company, Clearwater AI, that had developed a very powerful, probably black box AI system that could take any picture that a police agency gave them and run it through uh, this algorithm that would match it to publicly available pictures on the internet. So you walk past the CCTV, the police want to know who you are, they run it through the system and it will match with your Facebook profile, right? Billions of images in this, uh, in this database. And very quickly, there was a across the board rejection of the, the sort of prudence of employing this technology at large, especially employing it in the absence of very strict controls. You saw uh, uh, congressional inquiry was launched, op-eds, you know, a lot of media action around it. And so that again, felt like a case where people said, actually, no, we get that there have been all sorts of intrusions on our privacy and it's not really cool, but you know, trawling the internet for billions of pictures to match to these images that police can get without any warrant requirement, maybe one bridge uh, too far. All of that is to say, I have reason to be optimistic. Okay, uh, we'll stay in an optimistic direction with this next question. Uh, this is from Christopher McRae. Is it possible to find a drone, drone application, maybe AI agriculture that 8 billion humans can get behind beyond all the political arguments? And along those same lines, Rafael Moreto is uh, asking about uh, UAVs in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I think um, run by the UN that are protecting okay. civilians. Yeah. So um, there are applications of drones and all of the technologies that we've talked about uh, today so far um, that I feel like everyone can get behind and that um, perhaps wouldn't require a really rigorous application of the you know, minutia of ethically driven standards and regulations, just because we all want this thing to happen agriculture being a, a strong contender, the use of drones for conservation, the use of drones for um, stringing, you know, power cables after a disaster. This was something that previously required an engineer to climb up a telephone pole, probably live wires all over the place, the, 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 the risk of falling. Uh, and, if you have a drone that can wire that along, then yeah, you know, we can all get along that. This has been a particularly uh, pronounced uh, phenomenon in the context of the, the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm, I'm amazed that we've gone 45 minutes without mentioning it, um, that it was bound to come up, uh, is that um, very early in the pandemic, there were a lot of discussions about how can we use AI to address this issue? How can we use drones to address this issue? And there was a lot of enthusiasm for um, those hypotheticals. And to be sure, I mean, it's a, this pandemic has been a terrible thing and anything that can uh, give us avenues to um, flatten the curve or to um, you know, make sure this ends sooner rather than later are worth exploring. But Two things there. One is that the unconsidered use of technologies um, in applications that are really untested um, always carries risks. There is a reason that in critical applications, we have really thorough standards and it just can't be any cowboy who wants to build a new airplane and fly it in the sky. Um, so 
if it's a, you know, maybe it works great, but if it's a new application, there has to be testing. There has to be a level of control because we just don't know what will happen. Um, but the second thing is that a lot of these technologies that have been proposed for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic are very powerful surveillance technologies. There is a concern that agencies will acquire these technologies specifically for the pandemic, but then will continue to use them. And the next time that there is a protest or a, you know, a, a, a movement that they want to address with some of these same principles of network graphing and such, that they will just apply it. And um, so that's why there's been a call for sunset clauses in, in some of these authorities. But, and this was something that Alex and I spoke about in, in a previous conversation. Um, there's also this, this potential concern around the normalization of these technologies, you know, that it, it gets used in a really beneficial public health capacity that we can all get behind. And that somehow by virtue of, you know, the, the, the virtue of the, the application itself, leads to applications that really we can't all get behind. It leads to perhaps a public acceptance that really requires more scrutiny than it's being given. But what's left in our minds is, oh, those drones are really great for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there's, there's got to be a lot of caution on all of those fronts. So bottom line is, yes, there are applications that we can all get behind, but it has to be a very considered process of getting behind these applications. This is from Kwame Marfo. Which global organizations are best positions to provide governance in AI ethics? That's, that's a question that I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to answer. I mean, um, you know, one thing that has emerged very clearly um, from the debate so far, and particularly in early efforts to operationalize AI ethics is that AI is not one thing. It's many, many things. It's not a uh, mustard gas, a chemical weapon that does one thing, has one sort of concrete set of dangers. And as a result, you know, the um, the, 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 an international treaty among government agencies or governments is probably the best vehicle to address it, right? Just because of the nature of the thing itself. What we're seeing with AI is that it can do all sorts of different things. It takes all sorts of different forms. It can be operated by all sorts of different people. And in each of those uh, matrices of application system and operator, there are different concerns, different ethical values have different weightings. And so there needs to be a more tailored approach. So my answer would probably be that actually there isn't one organization that's best placed, that, that, that this needs to be a sort of universal and collaborative uh, process of addressing the very many incarnations of AI. Because if you try and just create one standard of explainability for AI systems, um, you, you may be doomed to fail because there are different needs in different sectors. Okay. This is from Jeff Schaefer. Regarding the leth lethality enabling systems, it would be great to hear a bit more about the unique problems that stem from that symbiotic relationship. As an example, one thing that comes to mind is a scenario where the AI system is recommending targets with such rapidity in a kinetic battlefield situation that the human operator may, ne may not be able to provide any meaningful sort of control or decision-making guidance to counteract potentially dangerous choices by the system itself. This strikes me as akin to the problem of choice architecture on steroids. So that's a, a, a fantastic uh, question from, from, from Jeff. And that is, a, I couldn't have said it better myself that, uh, that there is one uh, significant issue. It overlaps with uh, another issue around these kinds of systems, these symbiotic systems or human machine systems, um, which is this question of trust, right? Uh, a, a system uh, operates really, really well. And you're supposed to be giving oversight to this system, 
and really checking its work as though you're a math teacher. Um, but it does the work so well every time that you just start trusting it and you just start pressing, yep, sure, 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 that's good. And then it does something wrong, right? And in this case, you have over-trusted the system. Sometimes people refer to this as machine or, or uh, machine bias or uh, automation bias, I should say. Um, and obviously that's a danger. You don't want people to over-trust systems that really need to be supervised closely. Okay, but what happens, and, and that's across the board, and it's a really tricky problem in and of itself, but uh, what happens to that human relationship after that first error, right? The machine told you with a 95% confidence that uh, it, it detected this thing and it turned out to be wrong. Um, next time it gives you a 95% confidence assessment, are you going to trust it the same way? Or is your trust going to swing in completely the opposite direction where you actually have, you know, have very little reason now to trust the system? And that could be equally problematic because maybe the system is indeed right. And in applications that, are, that we can all get behind, you'd, you know, you'd want the system to be right and you'd want the human to pay attention to the system. So that's one, the calibrating trust uh, is, is one of the sort of technical terms. The other, and I'm just going to allude to it because I'd, I'd love to hear about some of the other questions, is this whole, uh, all the questions around data. Um, AI systems are sensitive to the nature of the data that they ingest in ways that are very difficult for us to even get our heads around, let alone for organizations to prepare for. If the system's not good, the AI system won't behave well or it'll behave unpredictably. There may be bias in the system that the AI system would then in the training data that the system might then perpetuate. The data may be poisoned by an adversary um, or the, the, the data that the system was trained on doesn't cover all of the eventualities that the system might encounter in the world. And then the system again might behave unusually. So data is another one and it goes very much to this human machine uh, relationship particularly in situations as Jeff mentioned, where there isn't time to go back to the data itself. Um, this question that's probably on a lot of people's minds with the protests uh, combining with the pandemic. Uh, Amar Adia asks, is it technologically possible to track down faceless people in black? I guess meaning people wearing masks. It's a difficult question. I mean, it very much depends on what the law enforcement agency in question has, uh, how much time there and, and resources they're willing to invest in tracking one particular person. Um, if you want to track one particular person, uh, well, one, you can get humans to do that. Um, and it would be relatively easy if a little time consuming, assuming that you have lots of cameras uh, in the city. Um, if you want to do that at scale, that becomes a vastly more complex challenge requiring much more sophisticated technology, probably drawing from other data sets. There has been some discussion about how commercially available cell phone location data from protests can be purchased and that that might uh, give you know those who purchase it including potentially law enforcement agencies a good sense of where people uh, live but those are very initial reports it's a very powerful form of data very intrusive and highly unregulated um, that we should definitely be looking at because if there is that kind of tracking of of as you say, sort of faceless individuals, that might be one of the techniques that um, could be put to that. Um, so it really depends is the answer. Uh, I think maybe time for one more question. Uh, this is from Dom McGuire. Uh, on the fifth principle that humans are ultimately responsible 
What are your thoughts on advanced general intelligence in say 30 years, which may be behaviorally, behaviorally equivalent to humans and may be deserving of some form of moral standing so they could be responsible for their own actions? I raise this as AGI could be more powerful and capable than humans in the future and maybe more ethical in their actions than humans. I'm gonna give a very quick answer to that question. So maybe we have time to get to one more, which is we've been talking about artificial general intelligence for many years. It seems like it is still very, very, very far off. It is a fascinating philosophical discussion that I do not have the answers to, but that the good news is we'll probably have plenty of time to debate until we actually have to contend with, with that reality. So we need to start spinning the wheels there, but we have some time. And I think we should take that time because it is a very loaded question. So probably the last question from Lee Antoinette Chua. Are there any debates or existing discussions on how mysterious machines will affect and take effect on existing international humanitarian law? What are your primary thoughts or insights on this? So um, yes, there is a, a whole process ongoing at the UN, which I'm directly supporting through my work um, of debating exactly that question. And the fundamental question is, look, we have these existing, in many cases, very robust laws to govern uh, the conduct of militaries in war, right? These rules have existed for a long time. Are those rules enough to simply govern AI as well? Or does AI require new fit for purpose rules? Um, even if uh, you, um, you go with the, 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 the sort of former option that those rules are enough to govern AI, um, there is consensus in, within this group of experts that's debating this at the UN level um, that there's still gonna be a process of operationalizing the adherence to international humanitarian law in the application of some of these advanced autonomous systems. So even if you do not have to reinvent the wheel and create totally new rules, there will still be a process of fitting those rules to these new technologies, which is a very natural process for many new technologies that have emerged over the years. But I highly encourage you to uh, look at the work of the, it's the CCWGGE on lethal autonomous weapons. And you'll find a ton of resources on what that debate has looked like so far and what it will look like in the, the next two years. Arthur, that was terrific. Uh, it was a really fast hour. I hope we'll have a chance to uh, continue this conversation at a future webinar or even better at an in-person meeting. Um, your work is evidence, um, really specific evidence that ethics matter. Um, everything that you pointed to is the uh, importance of establishing principles to help in the governance regulation, the uses of these technologies. It's a vast topic. You've given us a lot to think about and a lot to follow up on. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, I also just want to remind the audience that we do record these webinars. So they'll be available on the Carnegie Council website and also on our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll be doing more events in the future. And our next uh, program will be next week at a special time. We'll be convening on Tuesday evening, June 9. Uh, so that I can speak with our guest who's in Australia. It will be Wednesday, June 10th for him. Uh, this is Christian Barry, uh, who's at Australian National University in Canberra. And we're gonna be discussing his new article, which is posted on our website called Justifying Lockdown. So I hope that many of you can join us uh, for that event and for our future events. We'll be trying to do at least one a week uh, into the foreseeable future. So thank you again, Arthur. Thank you to everybody watching and listening and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you.